Welcome to Good Dog Pro, the weekly video podcast that's all about having a good dog without using fear or pain. Hosted by Drayton Michaels, CTC, Pitbull Guru, and founder of Urban Dogs and ModernDogTraining.com, and Kim Merritt, co-founder of GoodDogInABox.com and GoodDogPro.com, and founder of The URL Doctor. This episode is brought to you by GoodDogInABox.com, reward-based dog training and dog bite prevention products for families with kids and dogs. GoodDogPro.com, the online content subscription and community for dog professionals with reward-based dog training products, curriculums, and online courses to educate, motivate, and positively impact those that work with dogs. And ModernDogTraining.com, remote consulting for you and your dog with Drayton Michaels. Now, let's join Good Dog Pro. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Good Dog Pro video podcast, where we discuss and debate dog training without fear and pain. I'm Kim Merritt, co-founder of Good Dog in a Box, and I want to welcome my co-host today, Drayton Michaels. Hey, Drayton, how are you? How are you? I'm doing well, Kim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So our subject today, general impulse control and stress reduction for all dogs. And let's face it, if we're reducing the stress in our dogs, we're probably also reducing the stress in our own lives, which how could that be bad, right? So Hopefully, that's the plan. <laughs> Win-win. So let's start with schedules. So why does a dog owner want to be concerned about a schedule for their dog? We schedule everything in our lives. Our kids are on schedules. Why do we, why do we need to schedule the dog? Yeah. And it seems, it seems kind of weird, right? Like, you know, you're going to feed your dog and you're going to walk your dog and that might be on a schedule, but even that can get upended, right? So let's say you have, I don't know, an emergency with your children or there's weather that impedes something. It's just a really good idea to make sure that when you sit down and do your scheduling, because most people schedule stuff throughout the week, that you, you make sure your dog gets to that play date, or you really make sure that you get that three o'clock walk and you don't just let the dog in the backyard, you know? Let's do some quick math. Most dogs, and again, I'm not talking about dogs who live in really rural areas and things like that. I'm talking about, you know, people who live nine to five lives in, in the suburbs and the urban areas. Eight hours of sleep, eight hours at work, right? That's 16 hours of your day that your dog is inside. Most dogs, 23 to 22 hours a day, they're indoors, right? And, and they have to be because it's not humane to leave dogs outside. It's not safe. Right. But when they're outside, it's a big deal. And if they miss that walk because of weather or they miss something, you know, if you have things scheduled in for your dog each week, those little impediments that come into your schedule are going to be able to, you know, be assuaged by having these things in your schedule and knowing you got to get to it because things can fall through the crack, especially people who have a backyard. Um, you know, a lot of times the dog just goes in the backyard and it might be great and it might have an awesome time back there. But again, winter comes through rainy seasons, things like that. So when you have a schedule and you're just focused every day or every week on making sure you meet your dog's needs, this is crucial. You know, they get a chance to play, socialize with friends, maybe go on outings, work to eat toys. Uh, you know, it, all this stuff is a cumulative uh, approach to making sure that every day your dog is going to have less stress because that's the real underlying cause for a lot of the issues that people end up having with dogs, whether it's general impulse control issues or, you know, it bleeds into some sort of fear, anxiety and aggression type stuff because dogs are just not getting enough um, you know, of the things that they need. So for uh, for a dog owner, so how do they know what's enough? What's too much? Uh, how how do you how do you gauge that? Well, every dog's different. Every lifestyle is different. You know, I mean, some dogs have athletic needs. Some dogs have more social needs. All dogs need socialization with you know humans and dog friends, things of that nature. But it really boils down to the dog. You know, if you have a eight month old dog who's really energetic and has a lot of energy and is just a high energy type dog, then yeah, you definitely want to help your dog. You know, get that stuff out legally every day because you're going to run into problems you might have more of a laborious breed maybe you have like a large breed dog and they don't they're not really athletic they still want to go out and smell they might like to play tug they might need extra work to eat toys and puzzle toys all that stuff again cumulatively adds up to you have a dog who's going to feel better now you know if your dog has any sort of fear or stress or anxiety issues and socializing and you know generally going throughout the day with them is challenging this is, again, still something really crucial because if they have those issues, 
helping them with them proactively, whether it's with, you know, stress reduction or counter conditioning, things of that nature, when you're proactive, then you see over time, and sometimes you get dramatic results. If you get, you know, if you get the right combination of stuff, you can really help your dogs, regardless of where they're at in their life, regardless of their age, their breed, etc. being proactive and helping them meet their needs every day. That's how you have a really healthy dog and a really sound dog. So what do you say to, we're all busy, uh, uh, many of us work out, uh, out of the home, um, some of mm-hmm. us are lucky enough to work at home, but a, a lot of people work out of the home, and can't get home at lunchtime, so what do you say to somebody who's got a 9 to 5 job that's, you know, elsewhere, they can't get home during that time to, to be with or tend to their dog, how can they still keep a dog on a schedule? Sure. Well, I mean, if it's in your budget, you can always have a dog walker come in or you can have a trusted friend or family member or a neighbor stop by. A lot of times, you know, a 10 or 15 minute walk around the neighborhood with, you know, some treats for training and getting to gather scent, go to the bathroom, and then you bring the dog back in. They go to their gated area or a crate or if they can just be free in the house. Awesome. You give them a work to eat toy and then they work on that for 15, 20 minutes. That dog's going to do a lot better than if they don't have that break. If they can't get it, okay, that's understandable. Then just make sure when you get home and you do have the time that, again, you schedule it in. Look, we're all busy. We're all tired. We all have 100 things. You know, one of the things you have to understand is dogs don't understand anything about the 21st century. Like, they're still animals that want to do things that are intrinsic to them. Run, chase, chew, tug, right? Socialize with dogs, smell, dig, chew, like all that stuff. That's what dogs want to do. So we got to work it in. And honestly, it's a really good stress buster for us because if you're out there having a good time with your dog, you're not worried about stuff, you're not really thinking about things, you're just focused on your dog. And that's, you know, look, let's get down to the nitty gritty. That's why we get dogs, right? For companionship because we love them. They make us feel good. And a lot of times, and I see this because I work with a lot of different dynamics, people love their dog. But the main reason why they're calling me is they have forgotten to give their dog their needs daily. Right. It's reserved to, oh, yeah, Sundays we bring them to the farmer's market. Yeah, but what about Monday through Saturday? You know, the dog's going in the backyard for 10 minutes, coming in. They might get a walk. Maybe they're getting work to eat toys, right? Maybe, you know, sometimes. What about every night? You know, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's what I mean. Like, you know, good people can just kind of have their dogs fall through the cracks. And then the next thing you know, the dog has these behavior issues and it's usually related to stress. So is this something that has to be a rigid? schedule do we need to stay flexible what well staying flexible is good you know and when you get ahead of stuff you know you understand like okay if i get my dog out to the backyard every night between you know 6 30 and 7 for a rip and run with some fetch and tug and all that maybe bring the kids out there with them you know then give them a quick walk around the block for 15 minutes you know that 45 minutes when you do it is going to give you so much benefit when you get back in. You want to sit down with your family or you just want to relax. So you got to put the time in. Dogs are work. I always say roughly 30 hours a week to do it right, you know, and that's the minimum. Um, you know, it, if you want to look at it like staying flexible or rigid, the way I look at it is like this. You want to stay flexible with your criteria of what you ask the dog for. That's, that's what I mean. As far as your schedule, most people are giving their dogs scheduled things. What I'm saying is, Schedule extra. Really make sure they eat out of work to eat toys, right? Because again, if you give your dog a work to eat toy that takes 20 minutes, now you're looking at, you know, if you do that three times a day, that's almost an hour where they're providing, you're providing mental stimulation, they're doing stuff that's going to have a cumulative effect. And when I say stay flexible, I mean physically, like you have to be in shape for certain dogs, you know, not everybody, but you know, look, uh, uh, dogs are physicalities. That's what you have to do. You have to bend. You have to move. You have to interact with them in a physical way. And it, that's another benefit, right? So everybody, no matter who you are, you need to stay active, right? You got to stay healthy. Nobody should be living a sedentary life. No one, right? That's the thing that will kill you. You have to move, right? connected to your breath, all that stuff. Get out, get fresh air. Dogs are the number one, the number one motivation for people to not sit on their butt, And to go exercise a little bit and enjoy and socialize and get out, you know. So, you know, don't just let your dog fall through the cracks. That's what today's podcast is all about. Like, really think about it because it goes by quick. And one day you can't really walk them and they can't run because now they're 13 or 12 or whatever it is. And they're really limited. So you, I just made a post about this. 
when you're saying goodbye to your dog, you don't want to say, I wish I walked you more. Yeah. You very don't want to say, I wish I took you to the beach more. Very you true. You don't want to say that when you're crying and your dog's let, breathing their last breaths. You want to say, I gave you every damn thing I had, buddy. I gave it all to you, right? And that yeah. that that's really what like the crux of this is about. You know, that's kind of the motivation for me to, to be on this sort of, hey, schedule your dog, be aware that time goes quick. Because again, look, the joke here in, in Jersey is we get about two months a year where it's perfect weather to walk your dog. And those two months are not in a row. Right. Like two days here, five hours here. And depending on the time of the year, like it might be amazing from like six to noon. And then from noon to like midnight, it's just a downpour. Right. And everybody deals with that. So that's why it's crucial. And we're going to talk about some ways to make sure, you know, when the weather or schedule does upend you that you can still help your dog meet their needs. Well, let, let's talk about that. So, yeah. yeah, what what happens when it's snowing, when it's raining, when it's crappy weather and you can't right. go outside? What, you know, what, what do we do all year then? round? Because even if it's 100 degrees, that's right? a problem. Like not everybody has a dog from the African plains who are like, yeah, whatever. I have no hair. I love being out here. You know what I mean? And even I, if you do have that dog, right, let's say <laughs> you have a dog who's like, heat's not a problem for me, dad. And you're like, well, it is for me, son. Right. I have to now because uh, in the last 15 minutes, I've lost 10 pounds. I'm about to pass out and be hydrated. I right, throw the ball again, throw the ball again. Right. Uh, inside, buddy. We'll, we'll go, you know, we'll go inside and play. So again, weather's always a problem at some point for dog guardians. So Chewing and dissection, stress buster is extraordinaire. Okay, so let's, I have some examples here. Here is um, a toy by, um, I'm gonna give some shout outs by a company called Westpaw. This is their Tux toy. See this little hole right here. If you fill that with a quality wet dog food or you, you could freeze some uh, meat in there, whatever, tuna fish, that's about a 10, 15 minute time expenditure. So if you give your dogs three of these for dinner, right? Depending on how the size of your dog, we're gonna talk about sizes in a minute. But you're looking at dinner and breakfast could be an hour, 45 minutes, right? Of activity. Of, of, yeah. Of they have, they have, and, here's, here's, think here's, about. and here's what you did. Right. You did nothing but spill it up. I, I know this is going to take a long time. Wait, I'm almost done. Put it in the freezer. Do another one. Right. Okay. So that's the Tux toy. One of my favorite toys of all time is Planet Dog Orby. Okay. And they have a few different models, but I like this particular one. It's got this reservoir here. And a nice little cone shape. So what I love about this is you could put dry food in here, dehydrated raw, kibble, even pieces of meat. You could do combos. I would give this to my dogs about six times a day. It would take them 10, roughly 10 minutes a shot. That's an hour a day. And I went like this. All right, so I got to go through email. And, and then I'm done. All right, let me finish. So bully sticks, right? Bully sticks, dehydrated beef chews. You want to get odor-free, organic. This is another West Paw Tux toy. I always put my bully sticks in toys so that the last few inches are you know, more challenging for the dog to get out and swallow. But again, bully sticks are a great stress buster. You know, dogs sitting there chewing. Remember, chewing reduces stress, right? And here's a, a, new, to, a new thing that I've been using with some dogs, a little dental type chew. Okay, so all these things that are on the market for dogs to pull stuff out of, you know, food out of, you know, chew, all that. If it's healthy and it doesn't have any issues with your dog's digestion or teeth or any of that, Feed your dog out of work to eat toys. Uh, my first dog, he didn't eat out of a bowl for about five years when I discovered work to eat toys. From, from he was about five to 10, that five year span is when I really was like, wow, work to eat toys. And he would just eat out of Kongs and I would strategically feed. So chewing and dissection and, and, and strategic feeding. Let me give you an example. Your guests are coming at seven, but your dogs eat at six. Don't feed your dogs at six. Give them a little moose bouche, you know, a little, little, you know, a little, a little appetizer to keep them sane, right? But at five of seven, okay? And again, this is a little free tip. You call your people and say, hey, don't ring or knock, okay? Yeah, we're training with the dog. Just just let me know when you're close or you get in the driveway. All right, thanks. Boop, get your call. You have your dog go to their area, gated. You give them the first frozen Kong. People are, you know, look, if your dog doesn't have any fear or stress issues, they're just happy-go-lucky pups, they're going to maybe bark or be a little attentive to the people. And they're going to go right back to their food because they're an hour late on dinner. Right. You get to the restaurant an hour after you're supposed to and you sit down, you're eating bread so fast. They're like, are you going to hurt yourself? Right. So the thing about dogs is, you know, when they have something that's really valuable and they can work for it, that taps right in. Contra freeloading is something that they do uh, in zoos and in, in places like rescues where they have large animals and they have the offer to free food or they offer them 
work to food, you know, work to eat to get their food. And the animals, vast majority of them take the work. That's how animal brains are programmed, work for food. So it taps right in and it doesn't take us humans very much time to prepare it and the dogs get a huge benefit. So feed every meal out of a, uh, out of a toy. Pretty much. I mean, again, th this is where, you know, you have to, it, it, when you're a professional, when we get to the professional part, of, we talk about dog trainers, you've got to explain to people, this is how dogs prefer to eat. We, we have this romantic notion of tearing the bag and listening to the kibble hit the bowl and sit for the bowl. This whole thing, right? This, right, this whole romantic notion that, that's been drilled into us. I'd rather take two Kongs out of a freezer, throw them on the floor and go, all right, buddy, go have your dinner and let, and let the dog roll around the food for an hour and lay there and go, right? And if, you know, if it's going to be messy, have your dog do it in the crate, right? You know, I mean, that is a really, really good way to help your dogs every day, regardless of what else is going on in their life. If they're eating breakfast and dinner in work to eat toys, and it takes them on average an hour to do it whether you parse it out dry and you keep filling it or you give them frozen Kongs, you're looking at two hours a day of your dog doing work and you didn't have to do really anything. That's to me, I think that's phenomenal. When I heard that, I'm like, that's right up my alley. That's a good idea. That's <laughs> that a good works. idea. Yeah. That so. absolutely works. So <laughs> what, what's another stress buster that a dog owner can work on to occupy their dog and relieve stress? Well, one of the things that people really have to understand is that when you're out on a walk with your dog, that is the dog's walk. It is not your walk. Sorry, people. If you want to go power walk and jog and all that, and you want to bring your dog and they can do it, meaning they're not going to have any issues with it, great. Do a good five-minute walk and stretch and breathing and all that and let your dog get a bunch of scent before you go running with them. But generally, you should be out there allowing your dog to gather as much scent as possible. Okay, because dogs that gather scent are less stressed. They're going to have a lot of mental stimulation derived from gathering that scent. And, you know, a lot of people have this really antiquated notion that the dog has to walk by their side. And that's not true. Now, is a heel good? It sure is, but not all the time, right? I might need it in the vet office or I might need it in a tight sidewalk. But generally, I think you should just let dogs gather scent, hustle to the scent right? He's pulling. No, he's not. You're walking too slow. Move quicker. Hustle up to that. You know why? Because we just talked about it. Most dogs spend 22 to 23 hours a day in the house. And now you have them outside for a 15, 20 minute walk. And I know when somebody watches this, they're going to go, but I walk my dog for two hours. Great, great. Not everybody is walking their dog for two hours a day. They're not. Right. The average right. person is walking their dogs from 10 to 20 minutes, maybe 30, right? That's it. That's it. I know. I work with 400 dogs a year and most people are walking their dogs every day, their constitutional walk, two, three times a day, 10 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? So when they're out there, it is a huge deal. It is massive to them to smell that pole, to smell that tree, where did that dog pee? All that stuff is massive to them. So when I see people pulling their dogs around and not letting them smell, it breaks my heart because they're, it's kind of like taking a goldfish out of the water and going, ha ha, put it back in. Like, no, it's not cool. That goldfish is having a lot of stress because you just took it out of the water and put it back in. Well, we don't let a dog smell and you pull them off the smell and you're just walking, they're stressed. And there's a lot of subtle signs of stress people have never been educated on, so they don't know it. And they get the dog home and they think he's fine because he pooped and peed. But I've walked those dogs. And when people go, wow, he, he really settled in for you after like three minutes. I'm like, yeah, because I counter conditioned. I'm not busting his chops. I'm letting him smell. I'm hustling for him. I'm letting the dog walk. I call the way I walk dogs. I call it controlled freedom. Some people think I walk dogs like a drug detection officer, but that's just because I keep my head in the in the game and I'm looking around. Right? I don't sleep. There's a lot going on where I walk dogs. A lot can happen in a blink of an eye. So I pay attention. And I'm also not walking my dogs. I don't have dogs, so I'm walking clients' dogs. If you let your dog gather scent. They will do much better on a leash walk. It, I, I, and I realize you can't stay at the fire hydrant all day. So, you know, you give your dog a good three, four, maybe five seconds if you have to move on, whether it's weather or schedule. And then come here, pop, 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 pop. you can yes and treat them for the sound, you know, the little prompt. Or like I always tell people, most people do the same walk, right? They have the same few areas that they walk in. So if you're at the hydrant and you know your dog's going to want this row of trees, just come on, buddy, let's go. And then get them to the row of trees. 
because you know they're going to go there. So use that as the reinforcer to get off the hydrant, for example, and move on. So you can use scent to just move down as well. You know, just move down along your walk. And how how much time if I'm if I'm taking my dog out for a walk, how much time or how much of that walk should be devoted to letting them kind of do their scent thing versus the whole walk? The whole walk. Yeah, I know where I'm going. I know how to get home. I'm not worried about it. The more the dog's head's on the ground gathering scent, the easier it is for me to go, All right, what's going on out here? Is there a skateboard coming? That dog just barked. Where is he? Like, you know, like people have to realize that when dogs are on leash, especially a collar, but harness as well, like they don't have flight response, fight, flight, freeze. That's the classic three responses, right? So they can freeze on leash, they, they can freeze up and they can fight, bark, bark, bark. but they can't flee and they know it. Dogs know they do not have full range of motion, that they are contained just like any creature would, right? And so there's a lot of little stresses I equate it to driving. You might not be stressed the whole time you're driving, but I guarantee you at some point in everybody's day, you're like, what am I doing in this car? I can't wait to get out of this car. Oh my God, these people in front of me, right? And, and, and you might really like where you're going. You might love your car. You might be a good driver, but at some point you're like, ah, driving. So there's a lot of little and sometimes big moments on leash where dogs get really stressed and flummoxed and people, sadly, like the vast majority of people are not being educated on counter conditioning, which reduces stress, on allowing dogs to gather scent, which reduces stress, on proper leash mechanics so people aren't causing inordinate stresses or causing stress by, you know, pulling on dogs. Um, and when you factor all that in and you look at a dog being walked on leash and you understand all that, you're like, Ooh, uh, yeah, people don't know what they're doing. It's, it's really sad. And it gives, it gives a, gives a new perspective on how much respect we should have for dogs because, you know, when you think about how many dogs don't get to gather scent and really don't get to walk or get pulled around and not really like respected, your heart starts breaking and you start saying to yourself, mm, yeah, man, I got to do something about it. I got to either educate my friends and family if you're not a pro or if you're a pro, like, you know, that's what kicks me in the butt every morning. Like there's a lot of dogs out here who are going to be misunderstood and a lot of people who lack skill and knowledge. So I got to get on my game. That's what I see the most around my neighborhood when I walk are people wa walking their dogs, but just pulling the poor living and that's because out of and these that's, dogs when they smell. And that's because there are people out here telling people to do that. That's why. It's because of TV shows and other dog trainers out here who don't understand what I'm talking about, or if they do, they don't care. Cause I don't understand how you can know all this, right? Like if you're a professional and you have clients, you should have a really good understanding of scent. What a lot of people don't get told is there is a sequence called search, decide, track. And all dogs have it. In the search part of the sequence, the dog looks kind of confused. You ever see they're like, where do I go? Where do I go? Oh my God, I gotta smell, I gotta smell. And then they decide and then they track. And if you tap into that and you help them search, decide, track, they're going to have a lot less stress. But the problem is people have been sold this really antiquated notion that you have to walk your dog like you're in some sort of competition and they have to be by your side. And if they stop to do anything, they're disobeying you. And it's like this whole idea of control is ridiculous. What you need to do is teach your dog that they can control their environment about 99% of the time unless they can't, right? And that's how I go about with dogs on leash like you can do whatever you want as long as you can do it right you can't eat trash you can't step in the street you can't jump on people right you can't pull me down the street like a sled i'm gonna stop start like you know what i mean like there's there's exactly. rules here but you can do what you need to buddy it's your time out this is walk number two right and i'm only out here for 20 minutes so Mazel tov, man. Disneyland. Let's do it, kid. Whatever you need to do. That's how I approach walking my dog or my client's dogs when I have the privilege of walking my client's dogs. My head's in the game. I'm paying attention and I'm letting the dog be a dog. So you've mentioned counter conditioning a couple of times. Let's talk about that. Explain exactly what you mean and, and how does one go about doing that with their dog? Well, you can go to the Urban Dogs YouTube channel and check out all the videos on counter conditioning. Um, I have a general educational video about it. It's the most popular video on the channel, so you'll be able to find it right away. Um, counter conditioning is pairing stressful, fearful, weird, st startling events, pairing those with a high value food reward. So you're out walking your dog and they go, huh? And I don't care what it is, traffic, humans, or dogs, when they go, huh, even a sound, yes, and treat them, yes, like a, you know, like a clicker, a marker, you mark that moment and you pay them. 
And what you get is you get a dog who has less stress associated to sudden environmental contrast. And what you also get is an auto disengage. So in time, the dog's going to go, huh, pay me. And they're going to start to bounce off this stuff and look back or they'll bounce off the marker. You'll go, yes. And they'll hear that. Yes. And they'll turn around and you'll be able to pay them for disengaging. If you do this and all dogs have stress, the dog will have less stress. And if your dog has any kind of reactivity, this is going to help, right? You need distance and awareness. If it's too close, too soon, too sudden, it might all fall apart. And you just got to play triage and just get the hell out of there. Because if your dog's reacting or scared, you need to create distance. But if you have the distance and the awareness, you can get a lot of stress reduced by just marking and paying and counter conditioning your dog. Uh, puppies need it. Every dog I've ever worked with has had at some point, they've got some type of stress or fear or excitability even, right? Like I always tell people, if you have a dog who's like, oh my God, oh my God, I love all these people. I got to go see everybody, right? Because one of the things that people do with their puppy is they meet everybody. But then after a while, they're like, geez, this dog's socialized. I don't want to meet everybody. So what I say is fine. Don't meet everybody. Just meet the people you want to meet. Back off the sidewalk, right? 10, 15, 20 feet and just yes and treat your dog. And when they're bouncing around, just hold the leash short six inches. You know what's going to happen after two days of this? The dog's going to realize there's a lot less energy expended to just place my butt on the ground or stand here and take the food for these people passing. Their little butt's still wiggling. They still love people, but all the get to, get to you, get to you goes away because they're getting reinforced and they're learning, oh yeah, we don't meet everybody. We only meet certain people. So you can counter condition the dog for all these things and reduce their stress, help them with their frustration. And, you know, the ancillary benefit is, you know, you're getting these behaviors like sitting and waiting and disengaging off cues just as a byproduct. You don't really have to do much else. You just yes and treat. So that's what counter conditioning is. So any other suggestions for stress busters? Fetch and tug, fetch and tug, fetch and tug. If you have a dog who likes to fetch and dogs who like to tug, um, I think you should be doing that daily. Um, one of the things I often tell my puppy clients when they come into orientation is look at the two sheets on fetch and tug. And if your dogs have any interest in it, teach them to fetch and tug. And when I say tug, what I should really say is teach them to drop it because most dogs like to tug. And if they like to tug, the real challenge is getting them to drop it. But fetch and tug and teaching a dog to drop something when they're tugging is easy. And here it is. Short duration. So dog gets purchased, 1,001, 1,002. Release that pressure. Put food on the dog's nose and say, drop it. When they drop it, remove the rope. Give the dog the food. Keep the rope away. Get a behavior like a sit or a wait. Reconvene the tug. At some point, you're going to come around about halfway with the food. The dog's going to drop it because they're going to expect the food. right? They're going to know it's coming. So then you can start to use tug um, as your reinforcer. Drop it. Dog drops it. Boom. Take it. If you have a dog who can play tug by taking it and dropping it, Okay. And what I'm going to say next, I really mean this. The average person should not have their dog tugging on something for more than 10 seconds before they get to drop it. And the reason is, is tugging is self-reinforcing. And the most important thing about tug is the dog learns to drop it. Because, you know, if you're at a barbecue or out somewhere and your dog grabs something and you go, drop it, guess what? They're going to be much more likely to pop their jaw open and drop it because they've been playing tug daily or, you know, weekly, whatever, and right. they're learning that cue to drop it. It's snowing, it's raining, it's hot. Seven to 10 minutes of tug, you can get sit, drop it, take it, leave it, touch, down, wait. You can get all those while you're playing tug. Okay, same with fetch, right? If you have a dog who's playing fetch and tug every day, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, seven minutes here, you're going to have a dog who's got a lot less stress and they're going to probably be really well trained because, and again, my favorite way to train dogs is with play. People think, oh, you use food. Yeah, I use food all the time. Dogs got to eat. I know how to use food. But my favorite way to train dogs is with like balls and ropes and dog toys and drop it and leave it and all that and running around like I'm a seven-year-old kid. Like that's my favorite way to train dogs is just go nuts in a yard or a basement woohoo, and just leave it, take it and just have fun. You know, and that's the other side of this. Like we're talking about reducing stress for people. I mean, for dogs, but the, the ancillary benefit is if you enjoy this and you right. should, you're going to feel a lot better after that, you know, 20, 30 minutes, 10 minutes, you know, with your dog doing stuff that they like. I like making dogs happy. It makes me happy. I'll be really honest. Like I, I like to make dogs happy. <laughs> well, and I mean, isn't that the point is in the end for everybody to feel good? I mean, yeah, again, right. that's why we have dogs, because they make mm -hmm. us feel good. And if we're not playing with them and enjoying them and getting outside with them, what's the point? I hear you. 
So it, it's just, it's a self-fulfilling thing. If we're making the dogs happy, we're going to be healthy, healthier and happier in the process as well. And I think that that's just great advice. So we're, we're down to our last minute. You want to give us a quick wrap up then of what we want to do to keep our dogs less stressed? Stay engaged in your dog's life every day. Put it on schedule. Make sure they've got chewing and dissection options that are legal. Make sure they're going out to places that they like to go to, going to dog friends' houses and walks with their buddies, play times. Allow them to gather scent. Make sure that you're out there counter conditioning fear and stress so that they're feeling less stress, even frustration and, you know, excitable moments can be counter conditioned. If you're doing all this, you're getting ahead of stuff. You got your weather app, you know, it's going to rain. So you get that walk in early, all these things. If you do this, you will have a much less stressed dog and a better trained dog because you're going to be proactive every day, communicating with your dog and helping them learn how life works. They're not just laying around and going in the yard here and there and going for a walk now and then it's every single day they're getting their needs met. And that's always going to help. Awesome advice, Drayton. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing with everyone uh, general impulse control and stress reduction for your dog. Uh, we are going to continue into the second half of this on gooddogpro.com for our professional trainers, if with for those that have a subscription. So please join us there and we're going to talk more about this great subject and we'll see everyone else next week. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks again. If you'd like to participate in the rest of today's conversation for professionals who work with dogs and receive continuing education credits from participating organizations for listening, visit gooddogpro.com and subscribe today. Use coupon DOGSROCK to get 40% off your first month or annual subscription.